I look like a hobbit. You're like a monster. I'm like this little dude in the corner beside you here. You look svelte. I feel like I should be sitting on a phone book next to you. <laughs> That's all recording? Is that all on there? Oh, like yeah. Gold? Okay, good. And it's, it's staying in, too. That's gold. <laughs> uh, so, Chris. You didn't share, he didn't share any notes with me. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah, this is a total ambush. Uh, but I, I've enjoyed you so much from the auction here at Triple Crown. And then, uh, even though uh, y'all kind of left Angfa out a little bit for a while, caught up in the end, you helped us out. I appreciate that at the, uh, the banquet. I kept lots of rainbow fish back in the day. I'm okay. one of, Gary okay. Lang, if you bought that, if, I don't know if you ever seen that little magazine, or it was the first publication that the Rainbow Fish Study Group put out after the individual periodicals yeah. when Gary used to do it 100% by himself. Right. And he took the picture and like, if you got a copy of it, you got it mailed, it had an actual photo taped to the front. <laughs> Those were all Gary Lange. Well, I've written a few articles back in the day when I was okay. a kid. All right. I'll, I'll show the respect that I need to show. No, there's no I respect. I <laughs> but just in case folks at home don't know who you are, because YouTube land is a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> who are you? Where can they find you? I'm a disturbed Canadian. You don't want to find me. It's scary. Does that work? My, net, my channel, I have a small YouTube channel that's kind of put on pause right now with everything that's been happening with life. It'll come back. Pigs ain't going anywhere. It's called The Mad Aquarist. The Mad Aquarist. I like that name. And I think it's suiting. It, uh, There's a lot of madness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... We're gonna we're gonna go into what I like to call magical Christmas land, which is to say we're gonna go into a very made up scenario. We're at Triple Crown, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. Let's just say that Bentley snuck away on Friday, bought himself a lottery ticket, and won 1.2 billion dollars. That's what it's at. Worth the Canadian whiskey, and to celebrate, <laughs> does it have to be Canadian whiskey? Okay, bourbon dollars, is that better? Okay, that's fine. All right, all right. I like when I come down here to Kentucky because I'm always with Rusty. I always stay with Rusty. And when I come down here, he always asks, what do you want to drink? I always say Jack Daniels because it's not bourbon, it's from Tennessee. Just just poking the bear. I'm not, like, I'm not a purist, though. Like, I, I'm more about quantity and, like, obnoxious. You know, to me, I don't, like, if you were a scotch drinker, you would have, you know, you would enjoy scotch and you'd, you'd, know, you'd talk about caramel tones and all that, and you're like, no. I, I, and I don't need to buy good bourbon because I'm gonna mix it with something. And I like it. And a normal bottle of liquor can make four beautifully equal drinks. All right. So you need four cans of ginger ale and a bottle, you're good. All right. I might not make it to the fourth, <laughs> but you'll have a good time. So, let's, let's assume that in this magical scenario, we've won this atrocious amount of money. We, we're a couple now. We being me. It's the royal we. And before I go hiding off in some cabin in the woods never to be found ever again. Would I be your trophy wife? Because I'm sure you could do better. You are a lot prettier than me, though. I'm sh uh, trust me, you could do better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to celebrate and buy every single creator a custom-built 150-gallon aquarium. All the equipment they could ever need to run. And I'm going to fill it with fish for you, but you only get one species. What are you going to put in that tank? I don't know, man. That's a tough one. There's lots of fish. Like my interest in fish is keeping fish and to figure out the pieces of the puzzle to make that fish replicate in captivity. Okay. That's all I've ever done. Okay. And our local aquarium society kind of got to the point, kind of like a lot of the the real hardcore breeders kind of disappeared. And I miss that camaraderie where we were always, well, I just bred this, well, I just bred these, and I just bred this, and you know, we're always pushing each other along, and we're all better for it, sharing that knowledge and stuff. Yeah. And like now that I'm, I'm a little bit older and I'm just kind of just enjoying the fish, YouTube changed that a lot, but now that I'm just enjoying the fish, I like rec replicating a lot of different, uh, based on my, like the backgrounds and my science background stuff, I like trying to look at mimicking some of the habitats. Completely the opposite of what some of the speakers talked about in regards to the negativity of doing those types of scenarios. because. You can't mimic a natural habitat in a glass box. We know sure, that, right? Sure. But I enjoy those type of scenarios. 
Okay. Uh, I don't think I could narrow it down to a single fish. You guys, I did that 10 part series on uh, on cichlids and it messed up a lot of people because they didn't agree with mine. Well, you know, that's kind of the glory of doing a top 10 of my picks, you know, because I don't care what your top 10 are. That's my top 10. If you don't agree, I really don't care. They are, but my top 10 was a four video series, which is super obnoxious already. Yeah. But it was four video series, and it was done that way because every single fish in that series had a very distinctive story as to why it made it on that list. Okay, so you're about the story of fish. Well, that's... In a way. To me, like, every one of us, we're all on YouTube, we're all keeping fish, we all are passionate aquarists. All, every one of Every single yeah. person that's ever, that's here, obviously, is a passionate aquarist. Because they wouldn't have driven here for no reason. You came all the way from, like, Oregon, didn't you? Seattle. That's, yeah, that's a long way. That's actually probably... Did you drive? No, I flew, but okay. eight hours of flying uh, yeah. takes it out of you. Well, it was, like, 20 hours for us to drive. But, Ooh. like, you know, but that's still... That's, that, that's commitment. And that commitment's there because of what we what we enjoy, and this Absolutely. is a passion for us, right? But my passion is breeding fish. And now it's switching a little bit to setting up these biotope aquariums, but not necessarily biotope specific. But I try. Okay. And like uh, the two aquariums that I'm working with at home right now, there's a lot more coming. Part of the reason the channel's on pause. But one of the, like I have this beautiful Amazonian environment with uh, Tychochromus nateri, the red belly piranha, but they're wilds, you know. And I want to move them, and I brought them in as youngsters. And I put them into this 170 gallon or 80 gallon tank or whatever it is, and I'm just growing them up. And they're all about the size of my hand now. But I want to put them into the big tank, which will all be something I'll be featured on my channel, because I used to build big wooden aquariums for 30 plus years. Nice. And the last tank I had was 21 years old before we took the sledgehammer to it, before we, because we can't take it out of the house, right? And it was a 750. Well, this one's going to be in that 12, 13, 1400 gallon range. It's going to be about 12 feet by six feet front to back, by three feet, probably a little bit taller than three feet, because the glass pane is three feet tall. So it'd probably be about 42 tall. Wow. And I want to more than likely replicate a beautiful Amazonian style inspired aquarium. Maybe that's a better way. Instead of biotope, inspired aquarium based yeah. on nature. And I want those piranha to be one of the main fish in the tank. But I also want to put like a thousand cardinal tetras in there. Now maybe putting a thousand cardinal tetras Maybe by Wednesday, I only have 978. I don't know. But, you know, if you put enough of them in there, you won't notice, right? And then maybe put another stingray back in the tank. Because I'd bred stingrays before, and, like, I don't know. You know I just like that kids love that, right? And it's a big enough environment that it can do it. Yeah. But no intentions of breeding those things in that environment. Unless they naturally decide yeah. they want that to But happen. you go to any public aquarium, and I, I, I'm good friends with a lot of curators at the public aquariums and stuff like that. There'll only be stingrays in the aquarium. There will never be both sexes in the same tank, ever. Because the public aquariums can't sell fish. And in those environments, they will replicate. And then it becomes a problem. So almost invariably, the males will always be removed from the display. Always. Interesting. Interesting. So I know I totally digress from your talk. Yeah, no, but you know what? <laughs> I, I think it's fun because we get a good feeling for who you are. Yeah. You're going to be speaking at Fishtoberfest. Well, allegedly. Allegedly. I, I hope you are. Maybe. Because in this short period of time, I'm having a ball. <laughs> so I imagine that any talk you put on has to be just fantastic. Well, I don't know that. I'll leave that up to you to decide. <laughs> I basically look at it as like they've already paid the bill. By the time I come, they're going to give me a big wad of money. It doesn't matter what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've learned is... You're already building tanks way bigger than 150 gallons. I'm just, I'm not super. I have for years. This point. I'm, I'm not even giving you something that's worth it. Well, really. I don't know. Well, the other tank that I've been working on, and it's been the whole pandemic, but the pandemic posed a lot of challenges for all of us, right? Yeah. But I'm in central Canada. Canada didn't move anything. Commercial goods that originated out of Canada do not move within Canada during the pandemic. And I'm in central Canada. So all the fish in the world still kept coming, maybe at slower rates. But they'd hit the outskirts, they'd hit Vancouver, BC, and they'd hit Toronto. But in Manitoba, Canada, almost nothing came into Manitoba, Canada. So I had to find ways and diversify. But the one tank I was really excited about was setting up kind of a, a West African Congo river tank with really extreme fast water. Oh, fun. Now, there is a video on my channel, uh, I think it's entitled Where the Buffalo Roam or something like that, and it talks about one particular fish, and it's the buffalo head, the common buffalo head, and that's a really cool fish to me. It's in my top three. It's 
So it's in the, if you just want to skip and go right to the end, it's in the top three and there's a big story behind that fish. I finally was able to acquire that fish. I'm not going to tell you the story behind it because they can go watch that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that fish is so near and dear to me because of it. But you go back into the very early 80s when that fish was first coming over, it was almost impossible to keep alive because it came from like turbid class five rapids. And what did most of us have? We had an under gravel filter in a tank with air or pumps, or we had a sponge filter. And now you could buy buffalo heads, steatic craners, cassowaries at any auction and breed them in a 20 gallon tank with a sponge filter. But back in the day, they were a real challenge to keep alive. So the only way I was successful, it was just by luck and experimentation. That's what we do as aquarists, we have fun. I had about a 55 tank, it was the old school 55, 36 by 18 by 18. I put an under gravel, because that was the tech at the time. I put lighting diffuser panels over top so they couldn't dig down because it was a digger. Mm -hmm. Back then we used to think that the eggs were light sensitive was one of the, the factors for a lot of people having no success. They are not. Uh, but I'd put all these inverted clay flower pots and stuff like that. And then I put, at the time, four power heads. They were Hagen 801 power heads. That's totally me aging myself. But they were one of the first line of power heads or pumps, water pumps that came out at the time. And these were big, big pumps. You put like one on a 100 gallon tank. Well, I put four driving that under gravel. And you could see, and then you put the Venturi, the little airline, and it adds the bubbles. This tank, you couldn't take pictures of this tank. It was just absolutely turmoil. But I had super huge success with it. That's and that awesome. fish meant something to me, right? But it's, so. it's trying to figure out those pieces of that puzzle. So I've been trying to set up this Congo tank, but Oliver Lucanus, dear friend in, in Montreal, Canada, he runs belowwater.com. He collects all over the world. He's an export. He catches all these super cool fish that nobody else can get. He was trying to get me some really cool fish. And one of them was a, a, a unique species of uh, elephant nose. Okay. You know, mormids. And these are electronic, uh, electric fishes and stuff that use, uh, you know, little electrical pulses to find things in the dark water and stuff. And I wanted to have them in there instead of like, you know, you see a normal West African tank, it's got Credensis, it's got Congo Tetris, you know, Synodontis, you know, and that's, those are all things that are all from those areas. But I wanted to be a little bit more specific and niche with what I wanted to accomplish. But I just can't access fish. It's challenging. Hopefully that gets fixed soon. Yeah. But every fish that I'm going to want to do, say for YouTube, I want to have something that I can talk about that has a story behind it. Not necessarily my story, but it's a story that's got some interesting factors that I think people will want to learn or enjoy. And I also very much want to bring, because of my background, I want to bring that science to the people. Mm -hmm. I want to bring that science that you know, a lot of people are shying away from, not just nomenclature, but like a lot of the technical stuff of what makes these fish tick. Because most people don't want to pick up a scientific revision of a genus and start reading through it. They don't even understand most of the words. I don't mean that as a disrespectful thing. They're not even written really in English. Yeah, it's very... You know, understanding internal bone tough. structures in an inner ear on a cichlid, you know, and things like that. But that was the stuff that I grew up on. And like, I want to try and purvey those unique little traits in everything that I present. Awesome. That's what's cool. Everybody keeps what they keep because they like it. The one thing that I absolutely hate is when people would come up to you, and you've seen it too, is where people come to you, what's a cool fish to keep? You know, I actually have an answer for that every time I get it. Mm -hmm. And that is very simple. Anytime I get asked, like, what should I put in this tank? I'll tell people, go to your local fish store, look at every single tank in there. Yep. And then pick two to three fish that you, you know after looking at each tank for a couple minutes, you're willing to go back and watch that tank for 10 minutes. Yeah, that's good. And then go back, watch each of those tanks for 10 minutes, whatever those fish species are. Figure out the one that you can you know just by watching those extra 10 minutes. I could watch this for many more hours at my home. That one magic one. What's yeah. that one that really grips me? Don't buy it that day. Mm -hmm. Go home and research it. Yep. Make sure that you take the time, be patient, set the tank up right, then go back, get that fish. Because Maybe not that to, one, though. Well, you don't know. Possible, but that, that's the goal. That one that like really gripped you. Go back now. You're ready. Bring that fish home. Yep. Have success with it. Enjoy it long term. And then find what else cohesively works in that environment yeah, with that absolutely. fish. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. That's yep. that's always been my answer when you get those kind of questions because my tastes are different than yours. Yeah. You know, obviously, like you talked about that, 
The only thing I think is similar is that I love a story too. Yeah. So uh, an example is what I consider the crown jewel of my fish room is the running river rainbow fish. And it's 100% because of the story of a small group of scientists on basically 11 grand saving this fish from extinction yeah, that's cool. by being hybridized. And that makes it so much more interesting to me. And the whole story behind it is awesome. Yeah. And, that's and rainbow I, fish has changed so dramatically in this past decade. Like I have access to all the import lists and everything like that. Hans George Evers, the German, uh, yes. You know, he's, he was so instrumental in getting a lot of those fish into in, like Indonesia and those farms. But like, you look back in the day of rainbow fish lists, like when we would put out the little list for the rainbow fish study group, it was the same 15, 20 fish. It's just who's got what, right? Like, and that's all it was. Then you want to get a better quality of this one or a better quality of that one. But like, we were importing eggs from a gentleman that worked with Angfa. I don't even know if he's alive anymore. I believe his name was Ron Bowman. Yeah, he, uh, I think he's passed. Yeah, something. but like he was the one that was instrumental for getting, long before anybody was going over it now, before the Germans, before Gary, before any of those guys were going over really collecting, Ron Bowman was the one that was the one that was getting these fish out to people in North America. I know specifically Gary was like hugely instrumental in all that, but like little mops of eggs in little vials were shipped through the mail because they worked good for that, you know? And I don't think that's done anymore, but like nowadays you look at those lists from Indonesia, the variety that is available now is absolutely incredible. And you're getting new crazier species seemingly every couple of years. Yes. Because you've got people like Gary, like Johannes Groff, yep. like Wim, that are really going out there and just trekking They're going through, further and further, yeah. Trekking through crazy to find yep. the next great fish. Yep. And it, it presents another part of that story, that evolving fish story that is our hobby. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love it. Chris, I've had a blast. Thanks, my Thank friend. Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time. Anytime. Uh, Matt Aquarist on YouTube. Apparently. <laughs> when, when you post, that's where they can find you. Maybe speaking at Fishtober no, I'll be Fest. There. I'll be there. The channel's going through a bit of a change right now. It's been on pause because of like family issues and farm issues and sure, stuff. Sure, sure. But anybody that's followed me up until now, there's they follow me for fish or they follow me for two other things. All the weird critters, the bugs, the tarantulas, the danger stuff, or they follow me for the farm. So we are actually going to be in the process of separating all three channels. I cool. still will only post two videos a week. I can't do more than that. Yeah. But one will get posted to the fish channel, and one will get posted to the other two. So if you start right away and you go to the Mad Aquarius, subscribe. Bear with me that the channel, it's coming back. There's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much. Cool, man. Thanks, buddy. Cheers.